Okay, today the the feast of um, feast of Our Lady of the Snows, August the fifth, and today is a day in which we have in the Mass. It's a Mass of Feast of Our Lady, and uh, but we have of course today the feast that involves the famous Pope Liberius, and Liberius, the first Pope in the Catholic Church to not be canonized a saint, and he was the Pope involved with the miracle of the Mass today, which is a building of the most important church of Our Lady in the entire world. Our Lady of the Snows built St. Mary Majors, whereas we're in are kept the, 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 the relics of the birth of our Lord, or the, the, the crib of Bethlehem, and, that, uh, and so that the relics of the birth of our Lord are kept there in that church in Rome. It snowed on this day, August the 5th, back in the 400s when Pope Liberius was the Pope. And uh, he went to the top of the hill of the, in, in which Our Lady of the St. Mary Majors is. And the snow, he marked out with his crozier the outline of the church of Our Lady of the Snows. So a snowstorm came on top of the mountain only in the shape of a church. So Our Lady wanted a church to be built there and hence this, this church is called Lady of Snows. The snow in the hottest month in the in, in uh, in, in, in southern Italy, in Rome, and a miracle that uh, happened on this uh, Pope Liberius. And the same Pope Liberius, shortly after this miracle, and the building of the Church of Lady of St. Mary Majors, had many run-ins with the Arians, and he had the difficulty of dealing with St. Athanasius. And he was a Pope who excommunicated St. Athanasius three times. And he also signed the first and second document of Sirmium, which are two, one, the first document is a directly heretical document uh, that promotes directly the heresy of, Sir, uh, of Arianism. And the second one is a document which favors the heresy of Arianism without being directly heretical. And in the debates 150 years ago, or 130 years ago, back in the 18, 150 years ago now, in the 1870s, 1860s and 70s, concerning the battle of papal infallibility, there was much ink spilt over Pope Liberius, and digging back to the history of what was happened in the life of Pope Liberius, because he was a Pope who was supposed to have signed a heretical document, or at least a document that favored heresy, and he is a Pope who excommunicated three times by name St. Athanasius, and in the excommunication documents in which he excommunicated St. Athanasius, he said, in each, at least two of those three documents, he said uh, to the Arians, I'm excommunicating Athanas Athanasius, I condemn Athanasius, and uh, I agree with you, Arian bishops. I agree with you. I'm with you 100%. And many of the, the uh, authors of, of the, the last century said, well, Pope Liberius, he said he agreed with the Arians. He, he said that he, that he excommunicated Athanasius while he was under great pressure. And previous to his becoming Pope, he was a very orthodox pope, bishop. And he became elected Pope. When he became Pope, he was not Arian. But yet, after becoming Pope, with the pressure of the Arians and, and the circumstance of his papacy, he was the first Pope to bend, the first Pope to bend under pressure, and the first Pope to excommunicate a saint. And so, was Liberius actually a heretic? And did Liberius actually command the whole church to believe heresy? And there was very much ink spilt over him in the last 150 years, by which the, those who were opposed to papal infallibility, which are called the ultra, the Cisalpines, and they said Liberius violated the infallibility and inerrancy of the Pope, and, and not inerrancy, but the infallibility of the Pope, and that therefore the Pope cannot be called infallible. Meanwhile, the defenders of the papal infallibility said, no, there is not one single Pope in the history of the Church who many wicked, Liberius was one of the was controversial Popes, but Honorius was not controversial, he was a very wicked Pope, and, and, and uh, Pascal II was wicked. And, and uh, John XXII, who preached heresy, he was a holy pope, a very spiritual pope. He's the one who gave to us the song that I often sing after the Mass, which is Soul of My, Soul of Our, Soul of My Savior. He's the one that gave us that, that hymn, that, that, that he wrote it. So Pope John XXII, who was accused of being a heretic. And so how weak can a pope be? How far can a pope go? Because many people are now asking that question. I mean, how bad does Pope Francis have to be before he stops being pope? There must be some limit somewhere. There has to be a limit. 
And, uh, and so that when, when we, we can't, we haven't, we reached that limit. He's shutting down the Latin Mass. He is uh, crushing anyone who stands for the Catholic faith and Catholic tradition. He is friends with the greatest enemies of God available in the world in our age. He's not friends with the enemies of God. He's friends with the eight greatest enemies of God. He is actively working with the New World Order to make a one world government. And with that one world government, we can expect to be a one world church. He is exceedingly wicked. There has got to be a point where the Pope has gone too far. There must be a point where he just can't be Pope anymore. And here we ask the question of nature and degree. According to our Lord Jesus Christ, when he founded our Holy Church 2,000 years ago, he established St. Peter as the head of that church and his successors as the head of that church. And he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now consider that second part of the passage. I will build my, my, my church on Peter who is the rock. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, yes, but against the rock. The gates of hell shall strive to destroy the rock. They shall strive to prevail against the rock. St. Saint, uh, Saint Armour Bellarmine and many saints tell us that their rock, which is St. Peter, it shall be assailed, it shall be attacked. The rock shall be attacked. Hence our Lord Jesus Christ says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. I build my church upon the rock of Peter. And that, and, and then what, what do the saints tell us? Ubi es Petrus, ibi es Ecclesia. Where there is Peter, there is the church. And so Peter is where the church is. And we say oftentimes, you know, in regard to the family, where is the home? The home is where the mother is. If there is no mother, then there is no home. And so likewise, with regard to our Holy Mother, the Church, where is the Mother Church? Where, how do we define ourselves as members of this Church? We are those who are united in one faith, with one sacrifice, and one set of sacraments, united under one head, who is the Holy Father in Rome. Now when we consider the unity of the Church, there are, the Baltimore Catechism is the best definition. There are four unities of the Church. If one is missing, it's not the church. First, there is the unity of faith by which we are all united. This unity of faith is expressed in a unity of sacrifice. Now, there are many rites in the church, but all of these rites have the same crucifixion take place in the Mass. The same baptism is the end result of the many different ceremonies, the 23 different rites of the church of how we baptize someone. They're all essentially the same. And then the same with the other, other five sacraments, the same set of sacraments, and then the same uh, uh, united under the same head. We, uh, what is essential to the unity of our church is that we are united under the same physical head who has a divine jurisdiction over every human being on earth. And he is truly a living representative of God. Now we look down the last 2,000 years to, to Christ, and then go back 4,000 years in the Old Testament, and we will find that God always had human leaders of his church upon the earth. He always had prophets as his representatives in the Old Testament, and then replaced by kings, and then replaced by the high priest. So that there, were first, there was first the prophets, then there were the kings, and then there, were, there was the high priest. And, that, and so that by the time we arrived at Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church was the high priest, and the essential place of worship was the temple in Jerusalem. Now many of these leaders of the church, Old and New Testament, have been very wicked, and they have manifested every manner of sin that can be manifested. But then some say, well, when we come to the New Testament, God has protected in his church with infallibility. And that infallibility does not reside in a spiritual way in this thing called the church, but it resides in a physical way inside of the person of the Holy Father. That man who is in charge of the church, who is a real breathing man in statu vie, there are some that recently say, trying to answer the problem of how can we have such wicked popes, that the chair of Peter is 
is held by St. Peter, and the keys are St. Peter's keys, and the individual person who's connected to them is not very important. The chair of Peter is, is, is the chair of St. Peter, and when St. Peter died, the chair remained, and that chair has to be filled by a living successor on earth. So far, there's been about 265 living successors of St. Peter. The very first ones were holy, and the very first ones were saints. And the fathers tell us God gave special graces in the beginning to establish the holiness of his church, so that the twelve apostles, Judas, was wicked, but then he died and committed suicide. And exit Judas. Well, we know there will be wicked bishops, but Judas exited so that he would not cause trouble for the church. But the other eleven, and then St. Matthias, who took the place of Judas, they remained holy and had personal infallibility all the way until their death. All twelve apostles had infallibility, but the infallibility of eleven apostles was personal, and the infallibility of St. Paul also, the thirteenth apostle, was personal. But the infallibility of St. Peter was according to his office. His infallibility was different. And so that when he died, his infallibility remained in his successors. And we have a dogma of our church that there will be perpetual successors on the chair of Peter. So what does a Holy Mother of the Church teach us? There must be success, perpetual successors of St. Peter upon his chair. And these successors, who will be real men living on this earth, Presently, it's Francis in Rome, Francis Bergoglio in Rome, Francis I. So presently, there is a living man on the chair who is about ready to die, and before he dies, is trying to do the maximum amount of evil that he is able to do before he passes to eternal judgment. But nonetheless, he sits upon that chair. That this chair will be visible, that there will be successors of St. Peter in every age, Perpetual successors until the end of the world. That's what our church teaches. That this successor of St. Peter will be visible. He will be known to be the successor of St. Peter. He will not just be known to a few secret individuals that have secret knowledge, but like the Gnostics or heretics, but he will be known to the world as the head of our Holy Mother, the Church. Not only to Catholics, but also to non-Catholics. So that when we look down the last 2,000 years, we can point to many wicked popes. Most of the Johns were very wicked popes. Many of them died of venereal disease. They murdered their, 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 uh, their uh, what do you call it, their, their rivals, and they were very wicked. The, the, most of the popes named John, and that very few of them were holy, like St. John the First. After that, they were pretty much all bad. There are 23 Johns, actually 24, and the 20, 24th one is called John the 23rd. And the 23rd one was an anti-pope called John XXIII, and he was good. So the anti-pope John XXIII was actually a good man, but most of the Johns who were legitimate popes were wicked men, including John XXIII himself. So even though they weren't all wicked, the majority of them were bad. And then, and then of course, we have the heresies, and Liberius is the most famous because most ink is spilt over him because he favored the Arians, he signed a heretical document, and many, many, uh, no one ever worried about, no one questioned the, whether he signed that document or not back in the old days. The question about whether he signed it or not only came up in the 1800s, because it wasn't a concern of St. Athanasius that he signed that heretical document, nor was it a concern of St. Athanasius that Athanasius was, was excommunicated three times by Pope Liberius, just like Archbishop Lefebvre, when he was excommunicated by by John II, it was not a concern of Archbishop Lefebvre. The excommunication was worthless. It was meaningless. And the Archbishop Lefebvre said exactly what Athanasius would have said 2,000 years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago, I pay no heed to this excommunication. It's meaningless. I cannot be excommunicated for being a priest of God. I can't be excommunicated for doing the work of God. I can't be excommunicated for teaching the truth and providing for the priesthood for our Holy Mother of the Church. No Pope has the power to excommunicate me for those things. If I do something wicked, fine. But if I do that which is good and necessary for the salvation of souls, according to the tradition and spirit of our Church, I cannot be excommunicated. And you don't need to be a theologian to figure that out. Hence, Though Athanasius was excommunicated multiple times, no saint even worried about it. No one even questioned, oh, how could Athanasius be a saint? He was excommunicated by Pope Liberius. 
They considered it simply part of his glory that he was excommunicated by Liberius. His excommunication was meaningless and useless, except as regards Liberius, it led to his punishment by God. But other than Liberius being punished by God for excommunicating Athanasius, it had no bearing upon the church. What had bearing upon the church during that time of the 400s and the 300s? It was the Arian heresy. That is what had bearing upon the church during that time. And Pope Liberius excommunicating Athanasius, well, he can commit a sin. What does the church teach about the Holy Father? And the theologians universally teach the Holy Father is capable of sin. He is not impeccable, which means incapable of sin. He is infallible. He is not inerrant, which means can't make any error. He is infallible. Sacred Scripture is inerrant because it is the Word of God. That means in Sacred Scripture there can be no mistake of doctrine on any point. So if and in Sacred Scripture it says a dog has four legs, it is infallible and it has four legs. If it says Joshua made the sun to stand still, it means the sun had to have stood still. If it says that that Abraham had two sons. Those are all dogmas and teachings of our faith because every word that proceeded from the mouth of God must be true. Not one can be in error. Hence, when we're talking about the Bible, the Holy Scripture, there can be no error of any kind on any subject. Science, history, religion, math, it doesn't matter what the subject is. There can be no error in sacred Scripture. Scripture is inerrant. However, the Pope is not sacred scripture. The Pope is the successor of St. Peter. He is capable of being very errant, and many popes in history have held errors and heresies. John the 22nd, for instance, Pope John the 22nd, who was actually a holy pope, Pope John the 22nd held the heresy that the souls in heaven are not perfectly happy, because they don't have their bodies. And he believed the souls in heaven were not perfectly happy. And that is a heresy. Because when you're in heaven, you see God face to face. Also at that time, the Franciscans and Dominicans, it was in the 1300s, they weren't worried about Pope John the 22nd. He was in Avignon. He was one of the popes in Avignon. He was not in Rome. He was the Bishop of Rome. But I don't know if he ever visited Rome ever in his life. He was the Bishop of Rome. And uh, he knew Rome existed, he knew it was a town in Italy, but he went there about the same amount of times that you've been there. However, he was the true bishop of Rome, who was dwelling in Avignon, and the people attacked him, and they tried to kill him. He had to lock the doors of the papal chambers and set out his guards to protect himself from being killed. Why? Because he taught something different than what the ancestors taught concerning salvation. He, went, he is the one who went to the famous confession with the priest. And the priest refused to absolve him of his sins on his deathbed. And he said, you must recant or I will not absolve you. Notice how the priest was upset with John the 22nd. The people wanted to kill John the 22nd. He had to defend himself. And yet no one questioned his papacy. No one questioned whether or not he was the Holy Father. When John the Twelfth was wicked pope at the age of eighteen, and who, uh, who was bringing, uh, making him turn Rome into a brothel house, and have prostitutes and wickedness all around Rome, and as far as we know, he never had a holy day in his life, and he died by the time he was twenty years old. He became pope when he was eighteen. He died before he was twenty. He did not have a long reign. He died of the diseases, of the venereal diseases brought out by a wicked and impure life. Now he was the pope. And the people recognized him as the Holy Father. But they did not recognize his holiness, and they did not accept his wickedness. Somehow he became elected Pope. Why? Because of the corruption of Rome. What kind of cardinals elected that kind of a man Pope? Wicked cardinals. So now, when, when, when Alexander VI was elected, he was elected because he only had one girlfriend, and he was faithful to her. Whereas all of the other cardinals had multiple girlfriends, and they were really into greed, and they were far more wicked, and they wanted a pope that wasn't that bad. They elected him because he wasn't as bad as the other ones, and he had a concubine that lived in the Vatican with him. 
but he only had one concubine, and he was faithful to her, and he took care of his illegitimate kids, and so he was a pretty decent guy. And he was the Pope who excommunicated Martin Luther. So now there have been all kinds of sickness, sick, uh, sinfulness in the papacy. St. Thomas Aquinas says that our, the power of the priest comes from Christ. Now this is not only the power to make Christ present on the altar, nor the power and the power to baptize, also the power to rule. As a priest of God, the priest, as a pastor of a diocese, has authority from God over his people. This authority is of divine origin, and it is part of being a priest. We are called the sacrament of holy orders. We are not called the sacrament of holy sacrifice, which St. Thomas would prefer to call us, but we are the sacrament of holy orders, the sacrament of authority. Authority is so intimately Typed, uh, bound to priesthood, then whenever a bishop is consecrated who has no authority, like myself, have no authority, when bishops are consecrated without authority, they have to find a diocese for them to rule. Because bishop means boss. So how do you ordain a boss who's not a boss? When they, when they, when they came up with this idea of auxiliary bishops 700 years ago, and by the way, why did they come up with the idea? It's called laziness. See, priests are very lazy. You may have looked at you, and that bishops are supposed to confirm people in their diocese. Bishops are supposed to ordain priests. And 800 years ago, bishops said, I don't mind being in charge. I don't mind hunting. I don't mind having good beer and, and good grog. I don't mind ruling, but I'm not going to every parish and confirming people. Forget that. I'm not going over and ordaining these priests. I'm going to make another bishop to do that for me so I can have R&R, &R, uh, religion and something else. <laughs> so the fact is, that as to why is it that there came auxiliary bishops in the church? It started with something called corruption. The actual bishop of the diocese did not want to do his duty. And therefore, he got someone else to do it. And then they had a theological problem on their hands. And they were worried about it. How can you make a bishop who does not have authority. Well, we'll put him in charge of a piece of sand in Africa, because when Africa was taken over by the Muslims, all kinds of dioceses were wiped out. And so every time a bishop is consecrated, he has made an auxiliary bishop, he's made the titular bishop of a diocese that doesn't exist. So if, if, if that bishop can go to Africa and find that piece of sand, he's in charge there. He's got to go and find that piece of sand, and he rules there. The bishop has authority. Authority is so intimately connected to priesthood that we cannot separate it from priesthood. So just as we say you can have a valid priest who is very wicked, and a valid bishop who is very wicked, and the church tells us that when a, even when a priest or bishop leaves the, the Catholic Church, he still has the power to ordain. He still has the power to consecrate, make Christ present on the altar. But what about jurisdiction? Jurisdiction is also divine, and it's a necessary part of the priesthood. The priest is above the faithful. That's hierarchy. And the priest, therefore, has a divine hierarchy. Where does the divine hierarchy reside? It resides in the bishop of the diocese and by extension to the priests that are under him. It is, it, it, and it resides, in most especially, in the Bishop of Rome. This is a necessary part of the priesthood of our church. There must be perpetual successors, and many of the perpetual successors will be wicked men. How wicked does Pope Francis have to be? St. Thomas points out that the sin against faith, which is the one we're worried about, is a sin that is personal just like the sin against hope and charity, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, all of those six virtues, when we sin against them, they are personal sins. So St. Thomas says, the sin of faith is also a personal sin. And as personal sin does not take away the power of priesthood, when he sins by impurity, when he sins by greed, when he sins by any of those seven capital sins, the priest does not lose his priesthood, the bishop does not lose his episcopacy. Well, so likewise does he not lose his priesthood or episcopacy when he sins by faith. For his faith does not give him power, 
Therefore, when he loses his faith, his faith does not take it away. A priest is not a power because he believes in the blessed sacrament. He is an ordained priest, says words over bread, and Christ is present. But what about a bishop? A bishop who is consecrated bishop of the Diocese of Rome, that bishop is the bishop of the entire world. Now, his faith did not make him the bishop of the Diocese of Rome. It was Roman citizens, honorary Roman citizens called cardinals, who elected him as the bishop of Rome. When he became the bishop of Rome, he became the successor of St. Peter. He became bishop of Rome because he was elected bishop of Rome. He became bishop of Rome and he resides in that episcopacy and, is in the, and that his jurisdiction of his holy priesthood is not dependent upon his virtue or upon his vices. His sanctity does not make him bishop of Rome. And therefore, his sinfulness does not take it away. Now, what about the argument of the enemies concerning how sinful the Pope could be? Consider the sins that people are upset about right nowadays. These are sins that all many thousands, not thousands, only a few hundred popes, that many dozens of popes have committed in the past. Why are we so upset with Pope Francis? Consider the sins we're upset about. He is taking wicked men, putting them into places of authority. Many popes have done that. He is condemning good men. Tons of popes have done that. He is working with the enemies of God, as many popes before him have done. And he is working against the friends of God, as many popes before him have done. Why on earth did the pope suppress the Jesuits in the 1740s? Because the Jesuits were good. And because the Jesuits had saints. And because the Jesuits were converting the world, and the Jesuits were stopping the enemies of God from pro 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 proceeding forward in the demonic plan of destroying our world. Therefore, the Pope suppressed the Jesuits. Why did he do that? Because he was wicked. Why did he do that? Because he was friends with the most wicked men in the world. One of them at that time was named Plumbao, a Portuguese wicked man. And it was through the influence of Plumbao and some Frenchmen and others that, that the Pope, through his wickedness, suppressed the Jesuits. People are upset with Pope Francis because he is allowing divorce and remarriage. He is allowing all manner of evil. He isn't the first Pope to do that. The most serious sins of Pope Francis are not these moral evils, and yet many Popes have committed these moral evils in the past, such as the true Pope, Urban, whatever his name was, who killed the seven cardinals who did not elect him. He bribed all of the cardinals in the conclave to elect him. He wanted every cardinal to elect him. And if they refused, he said he would kill them. They decided, we think you should be a good pope. So they elected him. However, seven cardinals refused to elect him. He, was won, he won by an overall majority. True to his word, he said, I said I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to prove to you that I live by my word. Because after all, I am a pope. So he took the seven cardinals who did not elect him. He had millstones constructed, put around their necks, and had them drown in the Tiber as he read that, is, that, that, he that scan our Lord said that if you scandalize me, it is, it is better to have a millstone put about your neck and to be cast in the sea. So therefore he constructed millstones, very spiritual thing to do. He put it around the necks of the seven cardinals and he threw them into the sea, except it wasn't the sea, it was too far away. He threw them into the Tiber that flows into the sea. And they were all drowned. And that was the act, the first official act of a real pope. He was more vicious than Pope Francis. He was the true Holy Father. The other cardinals became so angry that they gathered together and elected an anti-pope who is universally recognized by the historians and theologians as an anti-pope. The real pope was murderer. The real pope rigged his election. The real pope had voting machines back in, back in 1300 that made false elections. The real pope coerced the conclave. The real pope killed the ones who did not elect him. And he remained the true pope until he died. And then his successor was also recognized as the true pope. So we must remember that sin does not take away our baptism. 
Sin does not take away our confirmation. Sin does not take away our priesthood. Sin does not take away our episcopacy. And if one is a bishop of a diocese having jurisdiction from God, necessary jurisdiction, that is without which we cannot have a Catholic Church, this jurisdiction cannot be taken away by sin. Furthermore, the Bishop of Rome, who is the most important of all the bishops, this jurisdiction cannot be taken away by sin, including the sin against faith. Now what about the problem of the infallibility of the Pope? What do we mean when we say the Pope is infallible? First of all, we do not mean he is not capable of being a heretic. He can be a heretic. He can believe heresy. He can reject the true teachings of the Church. Also, it does not mean that he cannot teach heresy. Because he is allowed, it is sinful of course, he, he, can, he can teach heresy and still be a Pope, provided he teaches it privately as a private theologian. In other words, he does not teach it as the dogma of the church. So if a pope expresses a heresy like John XXII did, like Pascal II did, like Liberius did, like Pope Honorius did, and probably other popes as well, when these popes expressed heresy, error against the faith, they, they did it as but not in, in, in a binding manner against for the whole church. Another example is Paul VI who never ever bound the church to any kind of the heresies that are found in Vatican II. He carefully stated that these that this council is a not a dogmatic council. He carefully avoided saying anything that was a heresy with authority, and it angered many of the enemies of God, because Paul VI was most likely a Mason, and he was certainly one of the great evil men in the church history, and yet when he became Pope, he refused to fully exercise his full authority to condemn the to condemn the truth. A famous heretical pope was Pope like uh, Pope Vigilius, who was a heretic when he became pope. And he became pope on the condition that he would he would define the heresy of monothelitism. He killed the real pope Saint Silvarius. He was a murderer, and then he also became a true pope himself. But then he could not define monothelitism as a heresy which he vowed he would do. And as far as we know, the life of Pope Vigilius, he was a man that always fulfilled his word. But when he became Pope, he was not able to fulfill his word. He was prevented by the Holy Ghost. Furthermore, he underwent a conversion, and he actually condemned the heresy of monothelitism, and then the empress who made him Pope sent an army over, captured him, and he died in exile, under, under uh, being tortured and died in exile. He was not a martyr, but he died in exile, because he did not define the heresy of monothelitism. Pope Francis has said many wicked things, John Paul II also, as well as the, each of the previous popes. And yet look at the arguments of the St. Vicantists, who are our greatest enemies on this point, and you will note, that none of them can find any dogmatic proclamation that was made by any of these popes from John the 23rd until Pope Francis binding the entire church to any heresy. There isn't one such proclamation. The only proclamation over the last uh, 50 years that you can point to where the pope said no Catholic can believe was John Paul II when he said that no Catholic can believe that a woman can be a priest. And it just so happens that that statement is true and in accord with the teaching of the church down the last 2,000 years. No Catholic can believe that a woman can be a priest. It's impossible for a woman to be a priest. She is not capable of becoming a priest. She does not even have the matter required, which is a male, a male of the species, baptized male, to become a priest. She cannot be a priest. Pope John Paul II spoke the truth in this matter, and he said no Catholic can believe. We find that that when the popes, the modern wicked popes, have promoted evil, they do it in a personal way. They do it by laws and by, by, by rules and regulations, which other popes have also done in the past. And that, we, that the pope can be most wicked, as wicked, as, in fact, he can be more wicked than any other man on earth, just like Judas. Judas, the priest, who was the, 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 the betrayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is traditionally placed at the very bottom of hell right next to Satan, chained to Satan, so that, there, that no matter how wicked you can be, you cannot be as wicked as Judas. 
Judas is the most wicked priest that there has ever been. And whenever priests are wicked and betray Christ, they are imitating Judas. But they do not reach the level of the wickedness of Judas as he who betrayed Christ 2,000 years ago. There can be and there, and there can be wicked priests and wicked bishops. The holiness of the church does not come from the holiness of the person in the office. A person in the office of priesthood, in the office of bishop, in the office of the bishop of Rome, who is called the Pope, these persons should be holy, and many times in history they have been holy. However, when you look at the vast majority of these men, priests, bishops, and popes, the majority of them have not been holy, and many of them have been exceedingly wicked. St. John Chrysostom said over 1,400 years ago that the majority of bishops and the majority of priests go to hell. That's what he said back then. He even said the road to hell is paved by the skulls of the bishops, that they are the ones who make it easiest for souls to go to hell by teaching them error and heresy, by being a scandal in their public office, by guiding wicked men into positions of authority and driving good men out of positions of authority, and so many times Bishop have facilitated the damnation of countless souls, hence paving the way to hell. But there are also saintly bishops and holy bishops, but the majority of bishops have not been that way. The holiness of a saint bishop does not make him bishop, and the wickedness of a wicked bishop does not make him not bishop, including the Bishop of Rome. So in any case, the Pope Liberius is one of the examples in history of the, of the human weakness that can be found inside of a pope. We go back to the very beginning, and we find St. Peter deny Christ three times. We find that St. Peter had to be corrected by St. Paul. We find that St. Peter was called Satan by our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet St. Peter was the rock upon which Christ would build his church. We also see that our Lord said, Peter, I have prayed for thee that when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren, so that Peter will need to be converted. But when he is converted, he can strengthen the brethren. And hence, we see two natures of the priesthood in, in general and of St. Uh, Peter and the highest priesthood in particular, that there will be a human side which involves much weakness and sin and a divine side which can never be stained. How is it that the papacy is not stained under Pope Francis? The reason is quite simple. He still sits in the chair that his ancestors sat in. He is still prevented from teaching heresy to the whole world as dogma of the church, and he has not done so. And he still carries the holy keys with him, and he will carry them until he dies. And those who are truly faithful to him are those who follow the teaching that the Pope stands for, which equals the teachings of Christ, who follow the morals that the Pope stands for, which are the morals of Christ. His personal morals, we hope, match the morals of Christ, but they often do not. In the case of Francis, they definitely do not. And his doc doctrine, we would hope, would match the doctrine of Christ. But very often, it, or often it does not. And in the case of Francis, it does not. And yet, he still does not exercise uh, any, he has never exercised any universal authority against his papacy. Furthermore, the last point, we consider the five points of the five opinions of St. Robert Berlaman. I believe that the last five popes have demonstrated that the third opinion is the correct opinion. It was a minor opinion in the time of St. Robert Bellarmine. The major opinion was number one, which is a pope can never ever become a heretic, so it'll never be an issue. But we know that he can become a heretic, so therefore we've got to consider two, three, four, and five. Hence, the saints who believe the pope, the theologians who believe opinion one, also believed in one, and as a backup, either two, three, four, or five. And then two, no Catholic can believe in, which is the opinion that a private heretic uh, or a heretic who has committed the sin of heresy uh, uh, where he loses his papacy right away. And this no Catholic can believe because of the visibility of the church. And Robert Bellman contends, and all the theologians condemn this second opinion. The third opinion is the minor opinion of the, of the last three opinions, and I believe it has been proven to be correct in our times. And this is the opinion of... Uh, of uh, a theologian by the name of B.U., B-I-O-U-X, a French theologian and some other ones, back in this time of St. Robert Bellarmine, who pointed out, if we have a heretical pope who manifests his heresy publicly before all men and is exceedingly wicked, like Saul was wicked, and like Caiaphas was wicked, etc., 
He cannot be touched. He must be accepted as Pope, and he will remain Pope until God removes him. And then VU said, what if we try the third, the fourth, and fifth option, which is to remove him from Pope papacy because he sinned against the faith, or to remove him from papacy because he has lost his papacy? If you do this, why is this to be done, says VU? According to Sarah Bellarmine and John of St. Thomas, who have different opinions, that we, if we have a bad pope, the church to defend itself can throw him out if it's a sin against the faith. No other sin but the sin against the faith alone. So we're going to throw him out. But if this is done, what's going to happen? Why is it going to be done, says BU number one? It's being done in order to make the church safe and to prevent a greater evil. However, this won't happen. Because when someone is elected Pope, and then a group tries to throw him out, certainly there will be a group that says, he's still the Pope. And we can be certain that the one who was thrown out will say, I'm not thrown out. And we will have a division in the church, like we did back in the 1300s. And there will be some that will follow the Pope who was already Pope, saying he still is Pope. And others who will follow the Pope who has been replacing him. And there will be a greater division in the church than there was when we had just one Pope. And the situation will not be better, it will be worse. The purpose of removing the Pope is to make the situation better. It will not make the situation better. Here be you is following the principle of a just war. In, the principle, in a just war, can you throw out a wicked leader? The answer is no. Unless you can make the situation better by throwing the wicked leader out. If you can make the situation better by throwing the wicked leader out, then you can throw him out. Except for a pope, of course, you can't throw a pope out. But any other wicked leader you can throw out if you can make the situation better. And B.U. says, if you try to throw this pope out, this heretical pope, you will not make the situation of the church better. For there will be many souls in the church, including good souls, who will say, I don't care how wicked he is, he's still the pope. And there will be other souls that say, no, let's accept the new pope. And then, when they start having elections and the, both popes die, we're going to have multiple popes, and we'll have a situation just as bad or worse than the Great Schism. Hence, if we have a wicked pope, stick it out. Accept him as the pope, live with him as pope, and wait until God replaces him. Further, says Cardinal of Zabiu, we have the defenses necessary to deal with the wicked pope. We already know that if a wicked pope tells us to believe heresy, we cannot believe it. If he tells us to practice sin, we cannot practice it. And we can defend ourselves even against a pope, but we have the right of self-defense. Hence, we don't need to remove the wicked pope. Let God remove the wicked pope like God removed King Saul. Hence, in our present situation, let God be the one that removes Pope Francis, and let God be the one that allows the pope to take his place, and meanwhile, we accept him thoroughly and completely as Pope, and we disobey him according to the rules of obedience which are already provided for, for us. We already have the defense measures that we need to live our faith and to go to heaven even under the direction of a wicked Pope. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.